first thank Kate for bringing me back to Marlboro. This is um, this is actually the first place in Vermont, other than UVM, that I got an opportunity to speak at. And so I have a, um, a fond, I think, very highly of Marlboro students, and obviously very highly of Kate, who is a colleague as well as a friend. And um, I've always enjoyed the engagement I get with the students here. Smart, engaging, and thoughtful. And I wish I was that smart and engaging and thoughtful when I was 21, 22 years old. So way ahead of where I was. Um, so let me just give you a little bit of preface of tonight's talk. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, a chapter in my book, which is currently titled Spatializing Blackness, and it'll be coming out sometime in two, 2014 um, at the University of Illinois Press. And the book largely looks at the relationship between race, gender, and geography. And it attempts to sort of map and detail the impact that forms of spatial constraint have had on black communities in Chicago from the early part of the 20th century up until the period after the civil rights movement in the 1970s, while also trying to demonstrate the demonstrate the consequences of those spatial arrangements. And so the book is sort of part historical, or as Foucault would call it, genealogical, while also being partially cultural studies, gender studies, um, and even um, part epidemiology, epidemiolo epidemiology, there we go. Spit that word out. So um, what I'm gonna present tonight is material from the first chapter of the book. And uh, let me say a little, let me say just a couple more things to preface. Um, I will, you know, I have a kind of prepared script, and so I try to stick to my prepared script, but I'll also sort of freestyle, and so I'll sort of go back and forth between my text here and, and a more extemporaneous style. Um, I have a couple of images that I'll show, you know, maybe about two-thirds of the way through, and then... Um, I, won't I won't be able to present all of the research from this chapter, and I'll sort of gesture towards some of the things that the chapter uh, grapples with in the latter part, but nevertheless, um, hopefully I can give you enough food for thought. So let me just start by saying that um, <coughs> I started doing this work in large part because I was trying to understand the mechanisms of segregation in the early part of the 20th century as blacks move out of the South and into cities like Chicago and New York. And I wanted to understand both the mechanisms and I wanted to understand the reasons why. And as a result, I really tried to focus on looking in places that historians tend not to look, like you know, literature, not all historians, but literature, cultural products, maps. And what I discovered was uh, that this history around segregation in Chicago, and um, I think also segregation in other cities like uh, New York or Boston or Detroit, um, was equally, if not more so, influenced by anxieties around sex particularly sex across the color line. Now, even in the contemporary moment, there are few taboos, more taboo than sex across the color line, what we call interracial sex, and, and a very particular kind of interracial sex. Right? There's certain kinds of interracial engagement that are seen as culturally acceptable, right? And, and seemingly normal, particularly like you know, Asian American men or Asian American well, particularly Asian American women with, with white men, um, growing more so in terms of acceptance, you know, maybe uh, uh, Latinas and white men. But the most taboo is by far black, white, interracial sex, particularly black men and white women. And its taboo is really demonstrated, I think, in a, in a number of ways. Um, our profound fear, anxiety, and fascination with it. Um, of all the 
porn genres, and there's lots of them. There's, there's got to be hundreds of porn genres. You know, all you have to do is make a porn film and you basically create your own genre. But of all of the porn genres, um, interracial sex is by far the most popular, particularly black, white, interracial sex. Actually, in many ways, black, white, interracial sex, interracial porn is interracial porn. The other kinds of porn are not necessarily seen as um, um, interracial. Black, white sex is always seen as um, the sort of signifier of interracial porn. And, and so, sort of keeping these sort of cultural realities in mind, political and social realities in mind, um, I decided to look at the impact that sex had on the organization of Chicago's geography. So I'm um, going to sort of read a little bit, you know, tell you about the talk, provide you with some evidence, and then, again, sort of tell you about some of the findings in the latter part of the chapter, and then I'll try to wrap it up. And so really around 8 o'clock, I'm going to wrap up my talk, and then we'll sort of extend it for maybe another 15 or 20 minutes more. Okay. So you know, my talk today examines the racial and sexual politics that inform the rise of carceral power in Chicago. Carceral power refers to the extension of prison mechanisms or prison forms of containment and organization beyond the landscape of the prison. Um, Foucault, whom I'll sort of reference a few times tonight, uh, is, is kind of rock star academic in the 19, uh, 1970s, most particularly in France. Um, <clears throat> he actually taught at the University of Vermont for a little while, right before he got sick. Did you know that? No. Yeah, he, he, he got sick at the University of Vermont. That's, that's when he got sick. And, Went back to France and he passed away. Um, uh, wrote this famous book called Discipline and Punish, and he argued that the sort of forms of carceral power um, had effectively enabled for the creation of what he called a disciplinary society, a society that was focused on disciplining and organizing people and drawing on the mechanics of the school, the prison, the hospital, which were congealed and perfected within a and subsequently redeployed throughout the society. And so I draw on this notion of carceral power to talk about Chicago and its form of segregation. So, um, and I do this by looking at the role interracial sex districts played in shaping Chicago's response to black migration and the subsequent measures it took to control and organize black sexuality. Uh, historically, my talk is gonna focus on the period between the sort of the latter part of the 19th century, uh, sort of Civil War period, uh, really up until about the 1920s, 1930s. Uh, so it's a, nevertheless a large swath of time, so I'll be, um, I guess, speaking quickly. Um, despite the growing popularity of sexual propriety in the late 19th and 20th centuries, vice districts, and everyone, does everyone know the vice district is a sort of ge a geographic place where you gamble, have um, uh, alcohol, and most importantly, I think vice districts are particularly known for prostitution and gambling. And so, and they were always sort of organized geographies. And they, all cities, um, uh, particularly northeastern and midwestern cities, had them. And they were sort of near the sort of downtown portion of the city. Um, so despite the growing popularity of, of sexual propriety in the late 19th and early 20th century, vice districts, which which effectively housed interracial sex zones, and I'll talk about them, um, they were tolerated. However, all that changed. A perfect storm of historical events, discourses, and politics created a stark color line that divided the sexual geographies of black and white in the city. The arrival of black migrants to northern cities during the First World War made many northern politicians reevaluate the tolerated sites of illicit sex. As black migrants moved in, discomfort with tolerated spaces of black, white, interracial sex increased. Uh, it was not long before they were being banished from the public. Now, the use of state power to limit or negate black, white intimacy gave rise to several spatial practices to delimit interracial sexual, to delimit interracial socializing, right? So initially the focus was on socializing, right? Because that's sort of seen as the, 
the kind of gateway drug to interracial sex, right? You know, like marijuana is to um, crack cocaine, as we talked about earlier. Um, Anti-vice and anti-miscegenation legislation transformed the geography of the city by spatializing interracial sex districts within black communities, tightening the screws that loosely held segregation intact. Doing this, and I think this is the sort of um, intervention I make, doing this helped to lay the groundwork for modern segregation in that it was part of the ideological glue that held it intact. White anxiety and fascination so, you know, I think anxiety and fascination are constantly working together, right? So there's on the one hand some sort of resistance, but that resistance sort of propels this kind of fascination and interest at the same time. White anxiety and fascination with black-white sex help to structure not only discourse about it, but also the physical environment of the city. Black-white sexual anxiety carved into the geography of the city structuring social and economic dis, uh, geographies of the city, as well as black-white interactions. Doing this gave rise to the insertion of police power into the quotidian or the everyday geographies of black Chicago. Through using police to drive out establishments that served, social, that, that served uh, the social space where interracial socializing thrived, these vice districts, uh, carceral power became part of the fabric of black Chicago. And this power was administrated largely through the criminal justice system in the form of policing. And after the interzones, which, are the, which is a term for uh, the sort of underground um, interracial sex zones, after the interzones were removed, police power, the police power that facilitated its removal Remained, right? So what we see is the insertion of police power into black geography as a way to sort of curtail, undermine, suppress, erase these interracial sex zones, right? And after that's done, the police stay, right? And this is where we really begin to see the insertion and the rise of policing in black communities, right? And this is early 20th century. This is like 1917, 1918, 1919, really on the heels of black, black migration. So um, this expression of racism took its pretense, uh, took as its pretense. So, so here's the, the, the sort of ideological uh, foundation, right? Moving, you know, as police move in, the, you know, the, the sort of, it's called the, the progressive era. I always found it fascinating that, you know, progressive politicians in the early 20th century were conservative. It, it, it's always struck me as ironic. So this is the progressive era. There's this move in, you know, move in. We have to clean up these districts, right? No more gambling, no more drugs, no more blues, no more jazz, no more alcohol, and damn sure no more sex across the color line. What, what race were there still use? Um, largely white, most, mostly white. Um, so, so there's this move by progressive politicians to clean up the city, and again, this, it's built on the pretense that there's something wrong with sex across the color line, particularly black-white sex across the color line. So this expression of racism, racism took, took as its pretense the belief that black sexuality was deviant and pathological. Among many things, this belief produced geographic consequences across scales, right? And so this is, if, 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 I, have, if I can say what my intervention in this discussion is, it's um, also trying to recognize the impact that this discourse or this belief that black sexuality is pathological. It's different. It's not like white people's sexuality, you know. And, and, and I mean, we can have a sort of broader discussion about this toward the end. But I contend that this produced not just um, social consequences, right, or just sort of discursive ones, but material consequences that were geographic and that were felt across scale, right, from the body to the city, if you will. Um, blacks moved into the city amid a new sexual politic that encouraged middle-class party goers to frequent bars and nightclubs of the poor and working-class immigrants. Term slumming, I'm not sure you all have heard that term before, term slumming, this practice fueled the urban commercial sex industry 
and helped to facilitate a period of racial and sexual transgression, right? So there'd be slummers. It's like, you know, I want to go and hang and see how the other side lives, right? You know, I want to see their, their juke joints. I want to see, you know, what they're doing. And again, it's sort of mar uh, largely, uh, almost exclusive, actually, sort of middle-class white party goers who were going into, you know, these poor ethnic neighborhoods and hanging out, partying. Um, so out of this grew several underground black-white sex districts, right? So the, the, the vice district was the space for slumming. People went there to slum. And out of this emerged these underground sex districts. Now, while they were never exclusively black and white, so they were Chinese, um, Mexican immigrants, uh, various uh, forms of Eastern Europe, particularly in Chicago, Polish, largely Polish and Irish. Um, so while it was never exclusively black and white, these interracial sex zones or interzones uh, created controversy and deep anxiety among both blacks and whites, um, albeit for different reasons, and we can talk about that. Actually, I'll, I'll say a little bit about it. Uh, white reform is held bent on ridding the city of immorality, so it's like, here we go. You know, again, progressive politicians, we got to clean up the city, um, uh, hell bent on uh, reforming, uh, on ridding the city of immorality, which the, in, which the interzones became a signifier of, tried to stamp them out um, through using the most readily available form of disciplinary force, which was policing. Almost at the moment when blacks moved north, vice squads entered their communities. This not only trapped vice within the interzones, um, which were part of the geography of the black community. So as black people move up, right, and this was the case across the country, Philadelphia, New York, Boston, Chicago, black people were forced to live near or in vice districts, right? And so, you know, we, we have this, you know, narrative that exists in the contemporary, right, that, you know, blacks, you know, black geographies are pathological, there's violence that's always going on, there's always this and that. And this, this, this history of black people only being allowed to live in vice districts, places that are already incurring the sort of wrath or the attention of the state, right? And so we begin to see the impact of this in this moment. So this not only trapped vice within the interzones, zones, uh, which were part of the black geography, which were part of the geography of the black community, but more importantly, it brought police presence into the black communities, right? So this is 1918, 1919, 1920. Um, prior to the interzones, black communities, while confronted with police, did not have the kind of sustained and concentrated exercise of carceral power within their geography, right? They, they you know, nevertheless, they were sort of policed at a, at a different rate than whites were, but what we see now is a sustained, geographically bound, organized insertion of police power into their geography, right? Um, the black middle class, uh, so the black middle class was by and large troubled by the interzones. They didn't really like the interzones. Um, and though they had different reasons, they also saw unchecked black sexuality, unchecked black sexuality of poor migrants to the city um, as at best a nuisance and at worst ex an example of white claims of black sexual deviance, right? So the black middle class, they were really bothered because they saw the interzones as being signifiers of these claims against about black sexual deviance, right? Because sleeping with a white person, particularly a man sleeping with a black man sleeping with a white woman, was taboo, it was sexually non-normative, it was out of the mainstream, and this was just a signifier that, um, that, that black people's sexuality was different, deviant, excessive, if you will. Right? And so the, the black middle class is having anxiety about this because they are, they're fearful of these claims, right? They don't want these claims to sort of um, prove this, this um, stereotype about black sexuality. Therefore, they attempted to regulate black men's sexuality, particularly through using middle-class notions of respectability as both a model and a service to the race. And so we see these middle-class blacks, right, particularly you know, lawyers, doctors, people who were called race men at the time. Right? They step forward and they say, look, get your sexuality together. 
stay out of the houses of prostitution, stay out of the vice districts, definitely stay out of the interzones, right? Sleep with your black wife, have no kind of, you know, sleep with black women, have no kind of, you know, non-normative liaisons across the color line, because that simply proves to white people that we are usual, right? So stop it, right? So it's about controlling ensure, or assuring up these forms of sexuality to delimit the possibility of being seen as decadent, right? And this, is, this tends to be how the sort of middle class has historically responded, right, to those who are seen as on the fringe, right? Effectively telling them to, like, get your act together, right? Stop telling, stop showing this to white people, right? Stop showing them that we are blah, 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 blah. So, um, so they attempt to regulate, in particular, not so much, um, it, I shouldn't say not so much, but in a very different kind of way. Um, but they, they focused really on regulating black men's sexuality, right? It became about really focusing in on finding ways to control, regulate, um, and organize black men's sexuality. And they sought to uh, mitigate further concern by claiming that blacks opposed interracial marriage. But really what happens is that, this is the, um, the grand, um, you know, what I, what I find fascinating about this chapter, is that you know, with all this focus on making sure black men aren't sleeping with white women, all this focus on trying to get rid of the interzones, right? control black sexuality, sure enough, make it respected, these black middle class leaders miss what was happening. And what was happening was police power was being inserted into their installed in very organized, bureaucratic, and administrative ways that were subtle, not, not coercive, not the kind of heavy hand of the state coming down, but this just sort of subtle movement of police power into those geographies that stay, right? And they miss it because they're, trying, they're, they're so obsessed with black men's sexuality. They're trying to make sure that, you know, the white world doesn't sort of see them as deviant, as wrong, right? And they absolutely miss what's right in front of them. Police power, and this will have tremendous consequences throughout the throughout the century. So let, let me, if I can, just for a moment, take a little step back. Let me see how we're doing with time. And perfect. So let me take the, you know the sort of bulk of the time, if, if I can, or uh, maybe about half of the time that I have left to talk about um, interracial sex in the South during the nineteenth century, and then I'll come back and talk a little bit more about Chicago and then I'll close out. So black-white sex has been constructed as the most deviant form of sexual activity, and it has produced widespread fears over the possibility of racial amalgamation and race suicide. No one racial group has a monopoly on concerns, fears, or anxieties of interracial sex, yet they do have radically distinct reasons for fearing interracial sex and they have strikingly similar reasons as well. Because black-white sex is seen as the most deviant form, exploring this context, I think, provides a useful reservoir to mine. And there's, you know, there's lots uh, there to be, um, to be explored. So historically, white fears over interracial intimacy paralleled black emancipation. And you can, you can it almost makes sense. Like, as soon as you say it, you're like, of course, right? Yes, it has to. <laughs> As the geography of slavery erodes with the demise of the Civil War, whites feared that without the geopolitical practices of slavery, that blacks would use their newfound mobility to attempt to foster personal and intimate relationships with whites. Under slavery, blacks were projected as childlike, docile, and in need of the patriarchal structure and in need of a patriarchal structure to control to control them. Sexuality, sexually, they were seen with, some, with ambivalence, right? Um, potentially troublesome at times, you know, maybe, you know, quote unquote, what one scholar calls overabundant, but never dangerous, never pathological, never oversex, never hypersexualized, right? Black sexuality in the South, you know, pre emancipation was not really seen as a, as a threat. It was not a threat. Indeed, before the Civil War, black sexuality was not seen as a threat to whites. Some scholars even report casual trips across the color line 
uh, by the most taboo interracial pairing, black men and white women. Now, while it wasn't encouraged, black male, white female sex did not evoke the kind of vitriol and violence it did after the Civil War. At least one scholar argues that the lower class position of white women who were sexually active with black men influenced perhaps the reason why it was tolerated. Yet it was the institution of slavery with its mechanisms of control and discipline that ultimately enabled its tolerance, right? So if people were okay with it, it was largely because segregation, because slavery kept seemingly a check on black people. Slavery, though not a complete institution, controlled many aspects of slave life, which in turn enabled whites to feel secure. However, without slavery, black sexuality in general and that of black men in particular was viewed skeptically, perniciously, and increasingly became subject to attack. This shift from ambivalence to threat is a product of the erosion of the perceived safeguards that whites felt kept limits on black men's sexuality. A black, a black freed man in the minds of many whites during this time was commiserate with not simply black white social equivalence, but black sexuality, but, but sexual equality as well. One scholar asks, what is it about black men that caused such outrage and hysteria in the minds of whites, particularly white men? And this, this scholar, she, she effectively contends that what we see is that um, emancipation becomes read as a mechanism of developing social and sexual relationships, right? And it's not about political equivalency, right? It's not simply about one man, one vote, black people controlling their labor power, or black people being able to move wherever they want to, right? It's about interpersonal relationships, the use and control of their own sexuality and their deployment of wherever they speak, right? And this becomes the sort of major um, point of contention and anxiety. Um, so, um, black sexual agency was a problem for white Southerners, not because, uh, not because it was a threat to health and safety of white Southerners. Indeed, the projection of black sexuality as vicious and violent was categorically untrue. So this is the discourse that emerges after the Civil War. But black sexual agency was a threat to the system of white supremacy and heteropatriarchy that colluded with it that made the exploitation of black women's labor and their bodies, the control of black men's labor and sexual agency, and the control of even white women's bodies central to its function. So what I'm arguing there effectively is that, you know, uh, slavery, there's oftentimes, I think, there's been a sort of hyper-focus on the economic, and, and the economic is important, you know. Like, Eric Williams was absolutely right slavery and capitalism, you know, so is C.L.R. James and you know, W.E.B. Du Bois, right, you know, I'm not critiquing, but that becomes the, the discourse, it's like to say, well, slavery and you know, economics, and I think there was something else that was going on, and I think part of that something else is this kind of control of sexuality, right, and it was controlling not simply black people's sexuality, but white, white, white sexuality, particularly white women's sexuality was being controlled, because it was seen as sort of categorically okay and acceptable and actually a kind of part of the culture of slavery for white men to have access to black female slaves. That was sort of part of the narrative, right? We know about Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemming, right? We know that that was, in, in, you know, institutionalized rape was part of, of slavery. Um, so there's, so that that sort of particular part, portion. Uh, but there's also a kind of regulation and control around white women's sexuality and obviously black men's. So, um, so I'm trying to really sort of tease out the sort of sexual politics of slavery, I guess what you can say. Um, and so, and for that reason, black sexual agency was seen as a threat to whites in the South. A response to this perceived, uh, as a response to this perceived threat, whites put in place a geographic system that sought to negate physical interaction across racial lines, instituting lines of demarcation that created separate spheres for black and white. And so, you know, under slavery, black people and white people lived together intimately. It was a very, like, you know, black people lived in the house, they went and 
black women raised black children, they were wet nurses, there was a deep and profound intimacy among blacks and whites. Emancipation happens, Jim Crow is installed, and we see this unbelievable bifurcation, right? That is, that, that focuses across scale, right? It's geographically installed, it's legally bound, and it manifests itself across scale. Um, it was constructed not only to recapture, the system was constructed not, uh, was constructed not only to recapture uh, the labor power of freed slaves to re-enslave them, as Du Bois argues, but it also functioned to regulate their sexuality. The lines of demarcation of Jim Crow were also racial sexual frontiers that were not to be transgressed. These borders, more or less, have always been part of the sexual landscape of the United States. Over time, they have been rearranged to encourage, excuse me, and discourage cross-racial interaction, right? So they were encouraging cross-racial interaction pre-slavery, particularly for white men. They were discouraging interracial interaction for particularly black men and white women after slavery. Um, that, uh, the alignment that emerged in this aftermath of the Civil War function to delimit black male, white female, white female interaction, uh, while also sort of enabling white men's access to black women uh, by controlling black men's sexuality. This was a fundamental part of the ideology of white supremacy and the driving force behind the spatial practices that underwrote Jim Crow segregation. The, spatial, the spatiality of Jim Crow made exclusion and denial fundamental to its function. Jim Crow created durable lines that had real meanings and provoked stiff consequences if disobeyed. The exclusion and denial function of Jim Crow segregation sought not only to keep blacks and whites separate, emphasizing black inferiority, uh, but it also worked to keep black men and white women apart physically. Separating blacks and whites in, for example, a bus to ensure the white supremacist state and, and, black, um, and black men and white women would never inhabit the same space. Their hands would never hold the same pole on the bus. Because blacks and whites, uh, because blacks had to get in, had to get uh, in on the back of the bus, they would never be able to physically interact, right? And so what I'm doing, what I'm trying to really talk about here is scale. Right? For geographers, scale is key. And what we see around the geopolitics of Jim Crow is that it functions across multiple scales. On the one hand, it functions at the scale of the body, making sure, for example, that in a tight, confined space, you know, I mean, you, you've been on a bus. You know how small a bus is. It's tiny, right? You can, fit, you can fit 50, 60 people in there. But in order to do that, you have to touch. You have to touch. You have to bump up against each other, right? Your bodies have to rub. And what the geopolitics of Jim Crow did was to ensure that that rubbing, that bumping, that interaction at the scale of the flesh happened intraracially. Whites can do it with whites, blacks can do it with blacks, but not interracially. No black-white touching in that respect. So you divide the bus up geographically, you organize it spatially, and you re-inscribe these dominant narratives about black sexual pathology, the purity of white women, the necessity of, of maintaining the race, the, the threat of race suicide. Black men are sort of in trying to impinge or encroach upon the ways of white southerners. White people are just trying to sort of fend them off. Social equality, sexual equality, you know, all of those discourses, all of these ideas manifest themselves in this sort of tiny place. And it's organized geographically to ensure that that amalgamation never happens, right? So there's no doubt that the mobility of, there's no doubt that the mobility experience in the years after the Civil War did transform black sexuality, right? <coughs> and I'll just say a couple of things about this, you know, um, it absolutely transformed sex, black sexuality. <coughs> black men and women could now have relationships that were not organized around um, commodification, right? Their, their bodies were no longer seen as commodities, right? And so they could have relationships 
And if they want produce children, that couldn't be sort of sold off, right? You know, black women had, for the most part, full control of their, their sexuality. It didn't have to be offered up to slave owners, right? It didn't have to be sort of sold off. Whatever fruit they bore, as in, in, uh, labor-wise, didn't have to sort of go off somewhere else, right? Black men didn't have to be sort of be forced to be involved with black women um, within the confines of the plantation, and neither did black women because they didn't have to produce offspring that could be useful in terms of generating product, uh, um, capital, or sold off, right? So all of those dynamic, dynamics are gone, right? So it absolutely changes black sexuality. Black sexuality is very different after, um, after slavery. But that difference doesn't necessarily entail this discourse that black people want access to white women, right? particularly black men want access to white women. Right? And that was the conflation. Right? It was conflated that social equality meant sexual equality, meant freedom, meant access to white women. Right? So, 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 so uh, in part, um, I'm arguing that you know Jim Crow, uh, that regulating black sexuality, particularly black men's, was the ideological and material component of Jim Crow racism. Right? It was a system built on ensuring this division. Uh, so, as I said earlier, uh, regulating black sexuality exists across many scales, and the various forms that came out of Jim Crow black codes, segregation in public facilities, so on and so forth, demonstrates the bodily scale regulating black sexuality, uh, regulating black sexuality function on. By separating blacks and whites in public, Jim Crow sought to negate even the possibility of black, white, black and white bodies touching. Jim Crow segregation acknowledged that spaces, that space is a pressing matter. That it mat and it matters which bodies press up against each other. Right? That was the, the, you know, the real anxiety of Jim Crow. And Jim Crow managed, managed work, to, um, work to disrupt the public space throughout the South by essentially um, creating sites of violence all throughout the South. So what happens is that one of the major ways that black men's sexuality was regulated was through lynching. Lynching became the signifier of supposedly black men's pathology, sexual aggressivity, and their lust and desire for white women. Because the discourse of lynching was this black man tried to or did rape this white woman. And I, let me just say, you know, categorically, they were untrue. It was untrue. Right? But this was the discourse. And that was used as a way to enact forms of mob violence all throughout the geography of the South. Between 1890 and 1940, the South left black people, and black men in particular, with no sanctuary, no place to hide, no place to feel safe. The entire geography of the South was a place of sheer terrorism. And I use terrorism explicitly. It was terrorism. Being in public was put put black men at risk. Walking down the street, you know, and and obviously having any kind of interaction with a white woman in public, be it looking at her funny or whistling, as one young Chicago boy did, and they lynched him and tortured him and beat him mercilessly. Right. So we have to recognize the way in which lynching really helps to control black men's sexuality, right? By reinforcing that they are not to have any kind of interaction whatsoever with white women. Not, not even the slightest hint, right? And Jim Crow helps to install a logic to ensure that that mechanism, that, uh, that that practice of no interaction is mechanical, organized, and is part of the landscape. So, um, just say a couple of things here, then I'm going to move on to my next section. Okay, so this system of, yeah, so this system of uh, regulating, let me check 
This system of the system of black male sexual regulation that emerged in the aftermath of the Civil War, which effectively constituted the geopolitics of the South post-emancipation, jumped scale beyond the region of the South as black people migrated the North. It played a formidable role in how the North, which cast itself as more forward-thinking and liberal than the backward South, would come to think of interracial sex and marriage. Like the South, northern cities would develop deep anxiety about the possibility of interracial sex and marriage. Indeed, by the early part of the 20th century, prohibiting miscegenation would become a major political issue of northern industrial cities, producing consequences that had severe negative implications for poor and working class blacks. The city of Chicago, is, is just an excellent case study in this sense because it really sort of demonstrates the consequences that emerge around anxiety and fascination with interracial sex. Okay, so, so black people moved north in 1917. That's really the major jumping off point. There's been a trickle before then, but really World War I facilitates it, right? In terms of demand for industrial labor, white men leaving the city, uh, industrial labor exploding and jobs need to be filled, right? This also against the backdrop of sheer terrorism in the South. Right? The politics of Jim Crow. So black people hightail it out of the South en masse. It's actually the largest movement of North Americans in the 20th century. Black people leave in the South. And, and effectively between 1917 and the latter part of the 1950s, three and a half million black people leave the South and shifts the black population from north to south. So Chicago was the city that actually accrued the largest population of black people. And that was because of the train lines. That's, that's, that's what determined where you went. Right? If you lived east of Alabama, you went to the east coast. Your people went to the east coast. So if you, if you live in Alabama, northern Florida, Georgia, Virginia, you went to New York. That's, that was pretty much the stop for you. You actually might go to Buffalo. Actually, that was one of the stops too. Uh, so so those, those are the factors that determine where you went, where you live, the train line. So because of the population density in Mississippi, um, particularly Mississippi, Arkansas, and the frequency of the train lines going up to Chicago, because Chicago was the midway point, you know, and it's also the, 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 the major place for slaughtering meat, the meat production. You know, it's the reason that Chicago still has a uh, reputation as a carnivorous city to this day. Uh, it's because the slaughter yards were in Chicago. Um, so, but as a result of that, they, they accrued the largest population of black people who left the South. And <clears throat> black people lived in the, or next to the Levy District, which was right next to the Black Belt. So actually, um, let me see. Do I have? I don't think I have a good Black Belt um, map on here. I don't think I do. Um, so, so effectively, the Black Belt um, sits right. It sits near Lake Michigan. And it was, it was just a strip of blocks that went from about, uh, at least at that time, it went from about 15th Street, 14th Street, down to like 21st, 22nd Street. So you can see that the Levy District, um, which is the Vice District, ends on 22nd Street. So the, the black community was effectively housed in the Vice District. So, as I said earlier, police go in, progressive politicians, they want to clean up the city, uh, they want to do away with the gambling, they want to do away with the prostitution, right? they want to obviously do away with this, uh, this uh, unregulated um, deviant sexual behavior. So they send in the vice squads, right? You've all heard of that term before, vice squads, and they get its name because um, they went in to destroy these places. So they destroyed them. Actually, they, they never destroyed the vice districts. And I should, uh, I should have prefaced, I should have said that earlier. They never destroyed the 
what they did was they drove them underground. So the Lviv between 1819 and like 1915 was this thriving, you know, this is a cartoon imagery of the Lviv somewhere around maybe 1905, 1906. It was a thriving, open vice district. And everybody went there. Tourists, when tourists came here, I have all these letters from tourists. Like when tourists came here in the early 19th century, they said, I want to go to Lviv because I want to gamble and I want prostitutes. Like that was, it was, it's like going to Amsterdam. People go to Amsterdam pretty much for two major reasons. And it's not to go to the Van Gogh Museum. The Van Gogh Museum is beautiful. You know, it's not about hanging out in Bombo Park. It's about smoking weed and having access to sex workers. That is a major reason for people going to a place like Amsterdam. And um, parenthetically, we're going to see a very similar form of drug tourism emerge in Colorado mm -hmm. in the next six months. Colorado is about to make some serious cash, mm -hmm. serious cash. And if they add you know, sex work to it, I mean, it'll be North America's <laughs> Amsterdam, which is the, the city of uh, libidinal love. So this was the spot to be. Everybody wanted to go to the Levy. Um, the mayor <laughs> was constantly in the Levy. He was always in the Levy, getting drunk, having, you know, having access to prostitutes, listening to jazz, right? Everybody loved the Levy. You know, and I have to just, it's important to know this. But when black people come and they live next to the Levy, and they begin to, and, and I should say, in the 19th and early 20th century before migration, black people were involved in the Levy, like everybody, because it was just, it was Chicago's thing, right? It was like, when I, when the first time I went to Amsterdam, I remember it was probably about nine o'clock in the morning, I was walking through the red light district, and a bunch of school kids were walking through. And I thought to myself, oh my God, you know, and you know, and if you've ever seen pictures of Amsterdam, you know, women are standing in the window, only women. Women are standing in the window, you know, they're sort of, you know, in lingerie, you know, this marijuana piping out of every single coffee shop, right? And I'm thinking like, oh my God, it's just, but then I had to think about it, I was like, you know, this is pretty normal to these kids. And in many respects, it was like that for the Levy. Right, the Levy was very much like that. So the Levy is this hugely popular place. And then black, people began to move in in around 1917, and they're living north of here, right? And this is the only place that they're allowed to live because restrictive covenants, which were organized legal mechanisms that were bound by contract law and deeds, excluded them from living any, anywhere else in the city. The city was saturated with restrictive covenants, which effectively said, we cannot rent, lease, sell to black people, <coughs> right? It was legally bound. So they were forced to live here. There were no restrictive covenants in this area near the Levy. They settle. They start getting involved in the Levy, as everyone else in Chicago did. Everybody else went to the Levy, had a good time. And by about 1921, we began to hear rumblings of there's a problem with this whole thing. We have to be concerned as a society with, with uh, it sort of under the guise of, um, I just want to check my time here, okay, I'm going to take about three more minutes and then I'm going to wrap up. Um, it was under the guise of being uh, concerned about the health, safety of sex workers, that this, con this emerging concern about the problem of, of the vice district. Uh, but really, it was a thinly veiled um, attempt to raise concern about the number of white sex workers here that were servicing non-white clientele, right? And the growing, um, the growing recognition that the Levy wasn't simply a place to give gambling and alcohol and to dance, but it was also a place to give, in particular, interracial sex. And there were all these little back rooms set up here to facilitate the transactions right, or, the, or the interactions. So the vice districts move in in around 1925. And what the vice districts do is they don't destroy them. 
They drive them underground, and they drive them underground by squeezing money out of the interzones. So all of these little places, so these are bars and nightclubs all over the Levine. You can see how sort of you know, packed it is. And what they did was they went in, and they went to an establishment that was um, a known, uh, that was a known um, uh, front for, uh, for an interzone, right? So they would have a sort of front room where there was jazz and alcohol being served. Actually, no, because this is during Prohibition. Um, so, so it was this, uh, where there was jazz, right? And there'd be a back room where uh, prostitution happened. Right, and that prostitution was largely black, white, interracial. It was largely interracial, but specifically black, white. And so they would go in and siphon money off of the, um, the, the owner, the, staff, the owner of the building. And they would effectively bleed him until he couldn't, so it forced him out of business. He had to give up the physical establishment and move his operation underground because the cops were bleeding him dry. And that's, that's pretty much what happened, right? There was, there was some you know, large-scale police action. There were raids here and there. But overwhelmingly, it was about bleeding them dry. And once they bled them dry and forced them to give up their establishment because they couldn't pay the cops and the rent at the same time, they moved it underground. The Levy disappeared. Black people moved into this whole portion. And vice stayed. And police pressure intensified in this geography. And it became more intense between 1930 and 1940 and 1950 and 1960. And as the Black Belt spread further south and a little bit east, right, that same police pressure that was installed to effectively gut this expanded right along with it. So what we see in so what my talk is really trying to demonstrate is that the, the emergence of carceral power in the kind of quotidian of the everyday geography of black Chicago emerged not to respond to crime, but really to respond to anxieties around sex across the color line. And that's one of the, that is the major reason why we see the continued relationship between black geographies, particularly in Chicago, and um, carceral punishment. And its start came from this history around interracial sex. So thank you very much for listening. And <laughs> sort of 1880s, right? 1870s, 1880s, which is this, this moment where you know, black people are actually gaining some political traction. You know, like black congressmen, black governors, you know, there's this moment of, of, of um, subtle moment of harmony between you know, blacks and whites in the South. Right? They're coming out of the Civil War, they're trying to sort of reconfigure their lives. But there's a, there's a number of men who are writing these letters and speaking and they're saying, look, um, we're concerned about our daughters. Right? And it, it's just this kind of patriarchal discourse, right? We're concerned about our daughters. And what we, what we see is that we see the blacks want to be part of our institutions, but we think it's actually a cloak for something else. We think that this is an opportunity for them to develop a, a sort of sexual relationship with women, and we, you know, we can't have that. And you see it you know, in the early in the 1870s, and it gains traction in the 1880s, really, really gains traction in the 1880s. And you know, at that time, um, and by the, by the end of the 1880s, like it's all over the place, right? You can, it's in magazines, it's in newspapers. And then um, Jim Crow is installed, you know, Plessy versus Ferguson happens, and then it, 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 an infrastructure emerges really to divide, right? And, and for me, an important component of that division is this anxiety around sex. Thank you. Other questions? What was thought of um, about interracial sex between white men and black women? Like Very good question. Um, it was socially acceptable pretty much throughout. Uh, it was socially acceptable among whites. White, 
white women obviously did not like it. They obviously didn't like it um, for a number of reasons. Not just the fact that their boyfriends or husbands were sleeping with other women, but the sort of racialized connotation of that interaction. But it was understood, well known, and very much part of the South, particularly throughout the 19th century, because the international slave trade ends in 1808. And so, sex between black men, or between um, slave masters and uh, female slaves becomes another sort of mechanism of extending the slave population, right? And he doesn't have to have any ties to these kids that are his, and, you know, so on and so forth. So it was widely known, widely practiced, um, and fairly acceptable, right? And this is the sort of patriarchal <coughs> standard, right? You know, like white men, it's like I can do whatever I want. You know, I sleep with whomever. But the moment it became about her, right? And, and you know, again, before slavery, there was, before, uh, before, you know, while slavery was installed, it, it wasn't as if, um, you know, whites were okay or, or celebrated uh, the moment that a white woman had sex with a black man and it was consensual, right? But it didn't have the kind of vitriol and violence, right? There was no like institutional framework to, to limit it, right? You know, she, was, she would be seen as, you know, trashy, right? She's poor, you know, so whatever was the kind of framework. Um, but after the Civil War, that was, it was done. There was no, um, there was, you know, class didn't matter. The fact that she had white skin and his was dark changed everything. Right? So, in part, there's a kind of patriarchal logic that underwrites it, you know, patriarchal double standard, and again, you know, this sort of deeply racialized framework that's informing um, how it's understood after the Civil War as to before the Civil War, and then also jumping scale and moving with black people um, north. There's well, one of the things I, I didn't mention in the, in the talk is that. Um, uh, Richard Wright's novel, Native Son. Right? Everybody's so familiar with Native Son, you've heard it, you know, Bigger Thomas. So, you know, Bigger, um, and, you know, I'm hoping when the book comes out, people will, will revisit uh, Richard Wright's novel, because I write extensively about Wright's novel. But there's, there's, a, there's a, a, several scenes in the novel about Bigger, and Mary alone. So, you know, Mary, he takes Mary out his first night on the job, and Mary gets drunk, and he has to take Mary up to his room, up to her room, right? And so he knows he has to do it because if he lets her go up there by herself, she's gonna wake up her parents, and they're gonna smell the alcohol, and Bigger's gonna be in trouble, right? And he knows he'll get way more than just fine young white girl, him, you know, he knows that something's gonna happen. So what he does is he takes her up to her room. He lays her in the bed. And there's this fascinating moment where Bigger says, I've never been this close to a white woman. Right? He can feel her breath on, because he's holding her. He's, she, she, her arm is over his shoulders and he's grabbing her and he has his arms around her. And Wright writes about you know, her hair falls on him. He can smell her breath smell her, you know, he can feel how soft she feels, right? He lays her down in the bed and then he just kind of sits there for a moment and just kind of stares at her. And it's, it's this sort of moment of fascination, fear, mixed with a little bit of lust and, and then her blind mother wakes up and Mary starts to rustle and Bigger holds a pillow over her face strangles her, she dies, he dismembers her, throws her in the um, furnace, and he runs, right? And, and there's a scene in the middle part of the book where they're hunting for Bigger. And um, so Bigger's, Bigger's uh, when Bigger kills Mary, uh, and the police discover it's Bigger and they hunt for him, it's immediately seen as a sexual crime. Right? <coughs> he raped her, right? So he raped her, and he strangled her, um, and then there's a scene where Big, where 
writes about um, precisely what I'm talking about, this kind of jumping scale, you know, the discourse about black sexuality is pathological and dangerous in, in the South, jump scale moves north. Uh, he writes about, so the story moves all over the nation, you know, um, you know, Negro kills white woman, you know, sexually molests white woman kills her, the story moves all over the nation. And so these Southern pundits, they write, they write to, they write in newspapers and they say, see, we told you, they're like animals, they're beasts. You should have installed mechanisms of control to ensure that they didn't have this kind of access to white women, right? Because that would never happen in the South, right? Some black man would never take, you know, some white girl out as a driver for the night. That just wouldn't happen. We, won't, we don't do that. And so it's your fault because you didn't install the necessary mechanisms to keep them away. And so there's this, you know, and so, you know, Wright is really riffing up as he's talking about it. And I think it's, it's a really um, um, fascinating demonstration of, of the way in which, you know, this discourse about you know, black people in the South and what they're like and their sexuality, right? And the way in which the South attempts to respond to that in ways that draw on the kind of logic of the South in terms of creating segregation on the one hand, but also trying to live up to these um, expectations of being liberal, right? And the fact of the matter is that the, the segregation in the South was, I mean, the segregation in the North was way more intense than anything in the South, right? The South was without sanctuary geographically in terms of black men, really had no place to feel safe in the public sphere. But what we see in the North is this very organized, mechanical, bureaucratic, and administrative, subtle, ubiquitous form of racial segregation that is deeply entrenched into the geography of the city. And again, it is informed by this sort of discursive rendering of the problems of um, black male sexuality, right? To ensure that another bigger Thomas situation. Other questions, comments? Could you just skip this? Yes, sir. Sure. When you hear like like rap artists, right? When they're always like rapping about like, yeah, I got my white girl, or yeah, like I'm, you know, there's like references of, mm -hmm. first of all, like, even if you the talk about- Snowflake like, reference. The snowflake reference. And then, okay, you already know about snowflake reference, so I don't need to dig deep into that. Mm -hmm. But always connecting um, this sort of like white girl to like power, to like the street hustle power and like also the reward. What is your take on that? Do you think, is yeah. that like a, a beneficial thing to like mm -hmm. um, diffuse inter interracial like um, mm -hmm. sexual relations? Or you, do you think that's like a, a stigma that's propagated through um, history? Yeah, I think it's the latter of the two. I mean, it's a, it's a stigma, and it's propagated, you know, historically, and it it maintains the same kind of um, logic that we see in the nineteenth and early twentieth century. That, you know, what I didn't talk about was the sort of way in which white women's sexuality is understood. And so, you know, the and white women's sexuality was seen as sort of iconic, right? It was universally woman. It was. Um, it was a kind of standard, it was pure, it was so, you know, all of these uh, adjectives. Um, and, you know, black sexuality is seen as sort of aggressive, blah, blah, blah. So, so as a result, you see in the contemporary um, that, that, you know, in this case, um, you know, rappers talking about, you know, their liaisons with white women, they, they also sort of, you know, reflect this notion that, you know, there's something unique, there's something important, valuable about this kind of sexual liaison, right? And, you know, really, it's no different. It's just, it, it's no different. The only difference is the ideological and historical backdrop, right? Which are important and real, but there's no sort of, like, value of material difference. I mean, it's, it's, it's exactly the same. Um, so it that logic is grounded in the kind of in really in the talk that I gave today. I mean, it has like hundred year old legs, and you know, um, what's what, what's also fascinating is that you know we're living in this moment of uh, 
seemingly the post-racial. Right? Race doesn't matter as much. And, you know, actually we're just living, living in a different racial moment. You know, race is always changing. We're just living in a different racial moment. That's it. Um, and we, and what we're seeing now is how those, how this new racial moment is playing itself out. And it's playing itself out in a certain kind of sexual politic, in part. And, you know, I think, for example, this is the first time I've ever seen public, white women in the public sphere who talk about and celebrate their love of black male sexuality. I can't recall a period of time. Actually, I've, uh, I've uh, parenthetically, I've read um, someone, a, a colleague of mine is doing a study on Doris Day who had this deep and penetrating fascination and fetishization and love of black men that she kept quiet. And he's, do, he's you know, digging all this information up and he's writing a book on it. Uh, but that was kept quiet. But um, Kim Kardashian is on TV every day talking about she loved black men. I mean, she's been on TV for like the last six years, right? And there's a number of, of white women who are, you know, sort of a part of this, right? And, and I find it fascinating, right? I really find it fascinating because on one hand, it sort of demonstrates that um, the taboo is now, it doesn't have to be sort of kept in a closet in the way that it was for presumably Doris Day, right? Um, or if we think about like Malcolm X's girlfriend you know, when he was Detroit Red, right? You know, that was kept in a closet. But now since the taboo is brought out into the open, you know, you have to ask, okay, so what, what is being said here? Like, what's being spoken? Is this a sort of like fetishizing the other, him fetishizing her, he, he, she fetishizing him? I mean, is this love? Like, like, what is it? How should we understand it? And I think this is just a, 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 a very different moment, right? You know, again, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, in the closet. Now it's much more about, you know, putting it out there um, and trying to, you know, on some, some ways it's kind of like a, like a look at me kind of thing, you know, like narcissism of the generation, I guess. But nevertheless, um, I think it, but, but nevertheless it's still, you know, deeply and profoundly taboo, but the taboo just functions in a different way. Yes, sir. Oh, you had your hands up, man, you look great. You know? All right, all right. Um, yes, sir. What, what about same sex interracial relations, they say? Yes, yes, I'm glad you asked. So, you know, same sex interracial relations have the same kind of, um, have a very similar kind of taboo, all right? And we might argue that, um, you know, in the, in the contemporary moment, it, it has. Well, I guess we could just say that it has a very similar kind of taboo, and the the taboo, the, the only difference in the taboo is the gender dynamic. Mm -hmm. That's the real difference, right? So, you know, um, black, white men, um, it's still sort of, you know, it's racialized in a particular way, um, sort of, you know, the logic of, you know, black men's sexuality, blah, 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 white men's sexuality, blah, 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 right? Um, but at the same time, there's no women there. So there's no, like, you know, there's no exaggeration around. There's, there's no need to sort of have fear about what's occurring. And when the relationships are between women, be, even though black women's sexuality is oftentimes read as being pathological like men, um, there's not the sort of historical anxiety around. Um, so, but, but, but black, white, you know, black, white, heteros, it's, you know, very different. I mean, like, like how long has The Bachelorette been on TV? Like 10 seasons or something. Never. They, they will not. They will not put a black man in that crew. They might do a very light Latino option. <laughs> very light. Very, very light. 
but they will not put a black man in equity. Ten years. Ten years, right? And I mean, that's just a sort of another you know, example of the anxiety. But the irony is that you, you look at the sales of Vivid. Vivid is, the, um, is one of the large um, porn houses on the West Coast, you know, Vivid Entertainment. Their number two selling product, black male, white female, interracial sex. <laughs> and so it's just like, because you know the fact of the matter is that the same people who are watching Vivid are also watching The Bachelor Bachelorette. <laughs> I mean, it's just, you know, just, just, just about sheer numbers. The same people who are watching Vivid are watching Bachelorette. And the protection of white female sexuality here, on the, on the one hand, and the desire to see black men and white women together here. It, you know, I mean, it's just like there, there's going to have to be a sort of splitting of the subject real soon, right? Because it's constantly sort of ideas of being housed in different ways. So, and you know, and we can go through like, you know, and I think we really see this in, in popular television, right? You know, you think about Sex in the City, you know, uh, Girls, right? Just the new show, um, the new Brooklyn version of Sex in the City, right? Um, and I've only seen a few episodes, but I just heard that my man, um, um, Donald Glover is on the show now. That's what I heard. So my guess is that he will be dating one of the white women on the show, right? So, so you know, that's, this is season, what, two or three, right? So uh, we'll see how that all works itself out. Uh, but, but yeah, it, it's still, despite, you know, just sort of despite the, the growth of this kind of um, fascination with it in the porn industry, still remains a humongous taboo. Right? Still you know, part of America's, I guess, original sin. I guess we got time for maybe one more. Mm -hmm. Anybody want to fire one out? I see you, I see you raising your hand and, and looking to see if anyone else is going to. Uh -huh. Do you have a question? Uh, no, you should go. Okay. Um, you mentioned uh, the black middle class um, trying to control black male sexuality through <coughs> through morality, you said. And you Largely. mentioned. Ch did you mention churches? I don't know what. Yeah. I was wondering what yeah. role religion or like what role morality and churches play in that. I don't yeah. Know if that's a useful question. That, that's a really good question. Yeah. So what the black the black middle class did is they effectively uh, used um, kind of sort of middle class morality uh, about. Um, we want, right, this is sort of the Chicago establishment. And these were preachers, these were sort of middle class businessmen, um, race men, and their um, discourse was, we want black people to stay, black men in particular, to stay out of the interzones, to get away from vice, because we feel <coughs> as if you all keep doing this, it's going to make it bad on the rest of us. So, Straighten up your sexuality, go home to your wives, stay away from white women, don't be involved in that at all, um, simply because we don't want this to look bad on us, right? right? That this will sort of reflect bad on all black people. And so it was this sort of, you know, moral tale. Right? <coughs> Get your sexuality in order so we can be okay. And the church was involved to the degree that it became a sort of site, and an important site for the, for the explosion of that discourse. You know, so, so it would run through church leaders, it would run through the congregation, you know, sort of part of the sort of running chatter about, you know, I saw Johnny at the, you know, the Blue Lagoon when I was walking down the street or whatever, right? So people in the church community keeping tabs on each other. And it, it sort of helped to sort of organize and galvanize that discourse about you know tightening up your or cleaning up your sexuality, um, and so and you know the black middle class has always has historically played a role similar to this, right? Um, they did it with respect to women's rights. They did it with respect, and and right now in the in the contemporary moment we see it around black GLBT 
you know, black middle class, very similar to what we saw in the early 20th century when you had these race leaders saying, hey, look, get your sexuality in order, right? Don't be out there doing that, you know, dirty stuff. Um, we have black middle class right now, particularly the religious section of it, saying the exact, the very same thing, right? But it has this kind of religious thing, you know, God says this, blah, 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 nonsense. And that, you know, you should get your sexuality in order. You should be with a man or you should be with a woman because being queer reflects badly on us. It makes these claims about our sexuality being deviant seem true, right? <coughs> so there's been this history, there's been this history about uh, this attempt to circumscribe and to delimit and control and regulate black sexuality among the black middle class. And so in many respects, the progressives, you know, sort of the, the sort of general white populace, if you will, and black middle class were all in cahoots. They were, they all agreed that the interzones are a bad idea. And the sort of, you know, black working class who were involved in them in many ways, they didn't, they didn't have a problem at all. They were like, everybody else is doing it. Like, why can't we? Like, why do we have to be punished for it? And, and you know, again, it was about sort of control to ensure that it was, that their sexuality was exceeding. Thank you.